Good morning. Uh, before we look at the psalm and the question, where is God in the suffering, which is our title for today, I'd just like to acknowledge the very real suffering that some people are going through right now. I know that there are people in church this morning who, or people who might be watching at home that are facing significant challenges with their health, both mental and physical, people who are struggling with depression. I know that there are people here who are walking through grief, people who are experiencing suffering because their children are suffering. There are people here who have experienced trauma or abuse or violence. And of course, the COVID pandemic has brought challenges for us all in different ways. Most of us at some point or another will experience suffering of some kind. And for many, suffering is something that's a lived reality for years and years and years. My own experience of suffering has largely been to do with uh, physical illness and pain. Some of you will know that um, after a car accident in 2000, I was diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder. And more recently, I've been diagnosed with two other related syndromes. There's rarely a day that I don't experience pain. My other symptoms include fatigue, vertigo, nausea, visual disturbances, allergies. I have problems with my heart rate, my blood pressure, my breathing, and my cognitive function is impaired. It's unpredictable, and some of the symptoms can be quite alarming. I know that sickness and pain has stolen not just from my life, but from my husband and children too. Suffering can deeply impact those we love and those who love us. It's difficult to understand the complexity of another person's suffering, even for those who are closest to us. And I'm certainly not pretending that just because I have some health challenges that I have a deep understanding of the very real and significant suffering that many people here are experiencing now or may have experienced in the past. Suffering can be a very lonely place. And for the most part, we only see the edges of another's suffering, the tip of the iceberg. And it's an iceberg that goes too deep for true companionship. And when our children, or those that we love most dearly, suffer, it can leave us feeling helpless and impotent. And that's, of course, suffering too. But when we suffer, whatever the depths, God can be with us. We have a God who knows everything there is to know about suffering. Not just the theory, but the first-hand lived reality. Our Bible is full of accounts of suffering, of grief, trauma, injustice, sickness, anguish, anguish even to the point of suicide. The Bible does not pretend that suffering is not a reality of life. And we don't pretend either. We live with the circumstances of suffering, the facts and our feelings around them. We don't have to deny them, and often we can't deny them. They're real, and they can be very bad indeed. But as Christians, we hold these facts and feelings in attention with the knowledge of the truth, the truth of God and his goodness. And just as our circumstances can be really bad, we can never, ever overestimate the goodness of God. So we hold the facts and the truth in a balance, sometimes leaning more into one than the other. Before we look at Psalm 13, I'd like to read Romans 5, 3. And we boast in the hope of glo the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
So here, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, talks of moving from suffering to perseverance to character and to hope. It's not an easy journey, and it's certainly not linear. We don't necessarily arrive at destination hope and have our feet firmly planted there forevermore. And I think Psalm 13 speaks something of this journey. (coughs) David has fled, the psalmist, has fled from King Paul and is hiding in a cave. It's a desperate situation. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David feels abandoned by God in his suffering. And he's leaning into that feeling. But the truth is, God has not abandoned him. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Isaiah 43.2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Hebrews 13.5, He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28.20, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Bible leaves us in absolutely no doubt that God has never and will never abandon David or us. But when we're suffering, it can be easier to lean into the facts of our circumstances or our feelings rather than into the truth of God. David is questioning God. But a more dangerous position is to distance ourselves from him completely. And in this cul-de-sac of suffering where we're, we're le- where are we left if we don't get back to the truth that God is with us. Well, we're left alone with our suffering, alone and without hope. It's not a safe place, and there is nothing good there for us. We need to get back into relationship with God, back into the truth of who he is and his goodness as quickly as possible. And we cannot rely on our feelings to motivate us to get there. But we do have some control about how long we stay in this place of questioning or distancing ourselves from God. The most reliable exit strategy from the cul-de-sac of suffering is the word of God. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to... even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what Hebrews 4.12 tells us. The word of God is a good measure of whether our thoughts and attitudes are in line with the truth. Worship is another weapon. And Elizabeth gave a testimony recently about worshipping in a crisis, raising an alleluia. She didn't feel like worshipping. It was an act of faith. And of course, we have prayer. When we talk with God, we know that he hears us. We can be reassured that he is with us and that we are not alone. And when we persevere in feeding ourselves with biblical truth and spending time with Jesus, we build a foundation that roots us in the place of truth when the storm comes. Perseverance develops the faith muscle that propels us back to the truth so that we can spend no time or as little time as possible in the place of suffering alone. And we can get back to the truth of God and his goodness as quickly as possible. Perseverance encourages us to join with others in prayer and to push in and see breakthrough. We see our prayers answered. We celebrate that that victory over suffering. It's glorious. God is good and we see and know and feel his power in our lives. We share our good news. We give testimony to his goodness. Victory feels good. But it doesn't always pan out like that. David writes, How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. At this point in the psalm, David isn't seeming very confident of victory. But David is a man after God's heart. That's how God himself describes him. 
He's a man of character. And when we move on to Christian character, we know that character isn't just about our personality or our disposition. Character is who we are because of our relationship with God. It's a description of who we are as Christians and what we are called to be in our entirety. It's evolving. It's not just a a glimpse of us at our lowest or highest moments. So although in the psalm, David is crying, how long will my enemies triumph over me? This is the same David who, when facing Goliath previously, cried out, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That's sounding more victorious. And this is the same David who later wrote Psalm 23. And that's certainly victorious. This is a man after God's heart, a man of character. Christian character is something that is built and learnt as we follow Jesus and as we allow the Holy Spirit to shape and mould us. Becoming Christ-like is the ultimate goal of the journey. And central to that is following Jesus in submitting our will to God's will. And submitting to God's will is hard. It was hard even for Jesus. When Jesus prayed, yet not my will but yours be done, an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Now that is some strengthening, an angel from heaven. And yet, Luke's gospel continues, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus found submitting to God's will hard. Now we will never have to experience suffering to the extent that Jesus did. And we can be assured that Jesus knows better than any of us how challenging and costly it can be for us to truly submit to God's will in our lives. But until we begin to do that, we're in danger of missing out on God's goodness and all the treasures that he has for us. Many years ago, I went to a healing conference in America. There was a lot of great teaching, plenty of prayer, people were being healed, and it was really exciting. But if I'm honest, I just felt exhausted. I was unwell and in pain. I'd had so many people praying for me to be healed that I got to a point where I couldn't face any more prayer. I just, I felt like I didn't have the energy to be upbeat and manage people's disappointment when I told them that I hadn't been healed. That's my bad, not theirs. And I I didn't feel disappointed or angry with God or anything like that. I just felt tired. And also at the conference, There were plenty of people giving words of encouragement and prophecies. And I had so many words about joy. And at first I thought, that's not really resonating with me. Maybe they haven't heard correctly, which is really unwise and really ungracious of me, I know. But I was listening out for a word about healing. I was hoping for an encouragement, a promise that I would be fully healed because then... I could be joyful, but I didn't get that. Instead, person after person were giving me words about joy. And to be honest, I was a bit disappointed because I wanted the the prophecy that I would be healed and I, I I wanted that great feeling that we get when a word from God really resonates with us. A little while after the healing conference, I remember realizing I didn't want my relationship with God to be mostly about me asking him to heal me. I wanted to talk and listen to him about other things. And I also remember experiencing a new kind of joy in my life, a kind of freedom. I was still in pain, but my attention was so much more focused on the other things that God was talking to me about. I hadn't closed my heart to him healing me. I still haven't. I felt released into a a fuller enjoyment of life. And the words that I had been given at the healing conference 
suddenly came back to me and they were remarkably accurate. A few weeks ago when Mark Ruoff was preaching, he spoke about the grit forming a pearl. And for way too long, I wanted my little bit of grit to form a pearl of my own design. Oh, I've suffered a bit. I've got some grit now. So come on, God, heal me. And then when I'm healthy and pain-free, I'll be, I'll be patient and kind. I'll, I'll be a better wife, a better mother, a better friend. I'll have an amazing career. Oh, and yeah, sorry, yeah, I'll be a better Christian. And I'll probably do amazing work for the kingdom too. Amen. My fantasy pearl was big and shiny and totally fake. The pearl that God wants to form, well, I don't know what it will look like. I think it might be very different, but it will be real. I know that God can heal physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I've seen physical healings, miracles. It's awesome, and it's absolutely to be celebrated. And of course, we are thankful when we see answered prayer. But I've also stood by a friend as she worships and declares the goodness of God at the funeral of her young child. And I'm regularly amazed and inspired by the Christians, some of them here, who work, walk through the darkest times with peace and joy and grace and hope and thanksgiving. And when we welcome the Holy Spirit to shape and mold us, when we choose to submit to God's will, the results might not be as immediately visible as a a swiftly answered prayer. But this ability to walk through extreme suffering and remain firmly and sometimes joyfully in the truth of God and his goodness, it transcends worldly understanding. And seeing that has probably impacted me more deeply than any of the miracles that I've seen. It's powerful. It might not feel victorious, but Easter Saturday, the day before the greatest victory history has ever known, probably didn't feel very victorious either. And I believe that when we choose to submit to God's will, there are eternal consequences. To build that kind of character, we have to release our needs, our hopes, and our dreams to God and choose to trust him. To say, Father, in my suffering, in my struggle, I give you my desire to be healed. I give you my desire to be released from suffering. Lord, I don't know what your plan is, but I'm choosing to trust that your plan is better than my dreams. And it's when we relinquish ourselves, when we've opened our hearts to God's love, to the Holy Spirit, that we're transformed. We move away from the facts of our circumstances to the truth of God, into the place of hope. And then, like David, at the end of the psalm, we can say, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Where is God in the suffering? He's with us. He's close to us. And he's inviting us into an encounter that is deeper than we might know at any other time. It's in the valleys that we learn more of who he is and experience his goodness more acutely and more sweetly than anywhere else, even the mountain tops. And if you're feeling alone in your suffering, if you're feeling like Colin described in the picture this morning, helpless and on the floor, Be assured that if you choose to allow God to join you, he will. Because he's already there. He's waiting. 
like in Colin's picture, Jesus is coming down off the throne. He's been waiting to pour out his love. You just have to open your heart to receive it. And wherever we find ourselves this morning, whether it's feeling alone in a place of suffering, firmly established in the land of hope, or somewhere in between, God has something for us. Let's open our hearts to receive it. Because when we meet with him, we open up the very real possibility of being overwhelmed. Not overwhelmed by the difficulty of our circumstances, but overwhelmed by his goodness. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are here with us. Whatever our circumstances, you are with us. Thank you that you will never leave us. And Lord, if we lose hope, please remind us that your plans are better than our dreams. Amen.